Good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening for the 2020 Eleanor Pedersen Lecture to be given by Mabel Wilson. I want to take a moment to acknowledge Alexa Gordon Glass, a close friend of Ms. Pedersen's for over 50 years, who founded this lecture series. Although Alexa is no longer with us, she's left us with a long lasting gift of presenting lectures dedicated to the voices of women in architecture as a tribute to Eleanor's significant impact on the discipline and her love of Cooper Union. Before I introduce Mabel, I wanna take a few minutes to speak about Eleanor, who received a certificate of architecture from Cooper Union in 1941. Eleanor Pedersen was born in Passaic, New Jersey in 1916. The daughter of a successful lumberman, she would eventually enroll in evening classes at the Cooper Union to, to study painting. Although not interested in architecture at the time, she was required to take an introductory course and discovered what would become a lifelong passion. At the encouragement of Professor Esmond Shaw, Eleanor decided to make architecture her major and career. After completing her studies at the Cooper Union, one of the only three female architecture majors in her class, Pedersen applied for an apprenticeship with Frank Lloyd Wright and was the only woman among the approximately 50 individuals who were accepted. Her time at Taliesin and Taliesin West taught her how to work with construction materials, but also how to live off the land. To that end, Pedersen not only constructed structures, she worked the fields. She slaughtered animals and took turns cooking and doing laundry. After her apprenticeship with Wright, Pedersen spent over four years working for the Tennessee Valley Authority, designing a visitor center, power service buildings, and other large-scale industrial structures. An observer of the explosion of suburban home building in New Jersey shortly after World War II, Pedersen set her sights on the town of Saddle River, where she purchased a large piece of property that contained a modest barn built in 1740. Pedersen renovated the structure into a live workspace with drafting tables in the former hayloft. She then began an architectural practice that would span over 50 years, becoming one of the most successful women architects in Northern New Jersey. In 1970, as her practice increasingly expanded, Pedersen designed and built a house adjacent to the barn, which she shared with her elderly mother. Over the years, Pedersen designed numerous homes, churches, resorts, and a college campus. She believed in bringing her clients into the design process as much as possible, and many of them ultimately became her friends. Her architecture was so treasured that in several instances, the second owners of her homes called upon her to make renovations or additions to the initial work. Some of Pedersen's design trademarks include the relationship of her structures to the landscape, often illustrated by the use of natural materials in both the interior and exterior, the carved entrance doors to her homes, none of which were ever the same, and her exquisite ceilings. Public service was an integral part of Pedersen's life. In 1985, she became the first woman president of the New Jersey Society of Architects. She was also a member of the Board of Trustees for the New Jersey Institute of Technology School of Architecture and a fellow of the AIA. In 1957, Pedersen founded the Bergen County chapter of Altruza International, an organization of professional women and men who volunteer their energies and expertise in projects dedicated to community service. She also served as president and district governor of Altruza. By the end of her career, she was licensed to practice architecture in a total of eight states. And now for this evening's lecture. Mabel Wilson is the Nancy and George E. Rupp Professor in Architecture and also a Professor in African American and African Diasporic Studies at Columbia University. She also serves as the Associate Director of the Institute for Research in African American Studies and co-directs Global Africa Lab. She's authored Begin with the Past, Building the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2017 and Negro Building, African Americans in the World of Fairs and Museums in 2012. She co-edited with Irene Chang and Charles Davis the recently published volume Race and Modern Architecture from the Enlightenment to Today in 2020, 
with her practice studio and she's a collaborator in the architectural team that recently completed the memorial to enslaved African-American laborers at the University of Virginia. For MoMA, she is co-curator for the forthcoming exhibition, Reconstructions, Blackness and Architecture in America. She's a founding member of Who Builds Your Architecture, a collective that advocates for fair labor practices on building sites worldwide. Mabel's lecture this evening is titled Bulletproofing America's Public Space, Race, Remembrance, and Emmett Till. Welcome, Mabel. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Mabel Wilson, and I want to thank Dean Nadir Tarani, the st uh, faculty and staff at Cooper Union for the honor of delivering this year's Eleanor Peterson Lecture. While we're unable to convene at the Great Hall due to COVID-19, I'm pleased to be speaking to you from Harlem in the great city of New York City, where our fellow New Yorkers have been doing an extraordinary job attending to those rendered ill from COVID-19. So my talk is part of a larger project that I've been working on for the past few years that examines the intersection of anti-Black racism the modern self-possessed liberal subject, like the citizen and the architect, and the built environment in the United States. Next month, the University of Pittsburgh will publish the volume, Race and Modern Architecture, A Critical History from the Enlightenment to the Present, that I co-edited with Irene Cheng and Charles David. I'm also currently developing a book manuscript, Building Race and Nation, Slavery, Indigenous Dispossession, and American Civic Architecture, that examines how racial difference, liberal democracy, and architecture shape the mutually constitutive concept of the citizen and the civic spaces of the United States from its founding up to the Civil War. The civic buildings I found emblematic of this entanglement, one that can be best described as the fundamental disavowal of the founding precepts of liberty, equality, and justice. Civic monuments became sites to imagine and enact American whiteness. The Virginia State Capitol, the plan and construction of Washington, D.C., the White House, the U.S. Capitol, and the Smithsonian Institute were all erected on land dispossessed from Algonquin indigenous people and built by enslaved Africans bought as human cargo to make the aforementioned stolen land profitable for crops like tobacco, rice, sugarcane, and cotton and available for settlement by white citizens. One of the recent design projects that I've worked on both as a designer and as a historian, and this one with the Boston firm of Haller and Yoon, and also one that engages these same questions of race and public space, is the University of Virginia's Memorial to Enslaved Laborers, which will open later in the year. Monuments to Black history pose several conceptual and design challenges. How, for example, does a monument to the history of slavery, like the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers, for instance, negotiate the inherent violence within the archives of slavery, whose records reduce black life to an entry on a ledger or quip in a letter, letter that characterizes the enslaved with the same fondness or frustration directed toward a farm animal. Can a memorial adequately remember slavery, given its reliance upon Western representational techniques of figuration and historical record reference? the denial of which identity and history was integral to the dehumanizing process that transformed a human, an African, into chattel or into property. How do you, perhaps, how can you make li Black lives in matter? We must be mindful that monuments like the Equal Justice Initiative's Memorial to Peace and Justice or the Emmett Till Historical Marker Project, both of which I'll discuss in my talk, appear in an American commemorative landscape shaped by the legacies of anti-Black racism. Those organizations like the United Daughters of the Confederacy mobilized the aesthetic project of public commemoration to create a false historical narrative of a lost cause which ignored the truth that the CSA's failed war to hold onto their wealth 
in human flesh. These monuments, like this monument of the Confederate General Stonewall Wall Jackson in Court Square, Charlottesville, are not monuments of the Confederate States of America, a failed nationalist project ended in 1865, but they are monuments erected by Americans in public spaces, in American cities and towns. How, therefore, can we understand Confederate monuments as American monuments? How are these works of art and architecture the embodiment of white supremacist values at the heart of American liberal democracy and racial capitalism, the effects of which had fost have fostered the enabling conditions, of, it fostered the conditions enabling COVID-19 to ravage black and community of colors around the nation. So perhaps we can delve into these questions during the live Q and A phase of this lecture. In October 2019, along a dusty stretch of a back road in northwestern Mississippi, workmen and activists installed a historical marker, the fourth one erected on this particular site. The workers sunk the heavy marker into the ground near a clearing called Grable Landing, adjacent to where each year rows of cotton plants sprout their puffy white boils ripe for harvest. The marker weighed over 500 pounds, a consequence of its composition of half inch thick AR steel sandwiched between three quarter inch plexiglass panels in order to make it bulletproof. The unusual use of abrasion resistant steel, a type of metal commonly used to withstand the punishing impact of mining and construction operations, as well as the force of bullets discharged on gun ranges, was necessitated by the historical event the marker commemorates the site where Emmett Till's mutilated corpse was allegedly dragged out of the murky depths of the nearby Tallahatchie River. Sometime in early 2019, three white University of Mississippi fraternity brothers posed proudly, one cradling a shotgun and another holding an AR-15 assault rifle alongside their prey. The bright purple bullet-ridden historical marker marking one location, Grable Landing, along the trail of Till's murder. The sign functioned as a fitting backdrop for a rite of passage into the fraternity of white supremacists. So that marker, the third one, replaced a second memorial placard removed in 2016 because it had been repeatedly pockmarked by a combination of 317 bullets and shotgun pellets. Vandals stole and tossed the first sign placed in 2008 into the Tallahatchie River. Other markers placed by the Emmett Till Memorial Commission, the Intrastate Civil Rights Trail Organization, and other Alabama state organizations to designate important sites of Till's calculating lynching have also been pocked with bullets and repeatedly defaced. This new marker with its plexiglass enclosure is designed to resist the impact of bullets while also registering these racially motivated acts of vandalism. It serves as a record of past and ongoing anti-Black violence. Emmett Till, a 14-year-old African boy, had been abducted and killed by two white vigilantes in the summer of 1955. This ruthless execution made national headlines when his mother, Mamie Till Mobley, then Till Bradley, insisted upon an open casket at his funeral that exposed the barbaric murder of her son. The haunting images of the unrecognizable child and the devastating documentation of his grieving mother, photographed by David Johnson and published in Jet Magazine, stunned the nation. When taking together, the bulletproof commemorative marker and the images of Till reveal, I will argue in my talk, how anti-Black violence has and continues to influence who gets to tell historical narratives in the nation's public spaces, especially in Southern cities where thousands of monuments to the mythic lost cause, the failed effort to constitute the Confederate States of America have created a tyrannical commemorative landscape. The new commemorative marker 
at Grable Landing narrates that dark moment in American civil rights history for those who visit the site. The marker says, quote, Emmett Till's body may have been removed from the river at this site. Cleared by enslaved persons in 1840, Grable began as a prominent steamboat landing, although an 1894 tornado eliminated all possible evidence of inhabitation, it left a clearing in an otherwise impenetrable veg vegetation that provided access to the river." Unquote. Even though its location along a remote dirt road, the new marker acknowledges its history of violence. Quote, it says on the sign, Signs erected here have been stolen, thrown in the river, replaced, shot, removed, replaced, and lost again. The history of vandalism and activism centered on this site led the Emmett Till Memorial Commission founder, Jeremy Little, to observe that Grable Landing was both a beacon of racial progress and a trenchant reminder of the progress yet to be made." End quote. The backwoods location of Grable Landing in the Mississippi Delta typifies the South's geography of small towns and farming communities where racial violence ensured enslaved Africans dutifully harvested acres of cotton. Their labor power, coerced through physical violence or, quote, deprivation and deprivation, end quote, as, as scholar Alex Wahele, he names, made the Deep South's planter class wealthy and fed the cotton industries of the 19th century New England and Great Britain. After the Civil War, the clandestine terror of the Ku Klux Klan, in concert with the organized theft of the right to vote and own property, crippled the political and economic prospects of newly emancipated Black citizens. To survive, albeit a meager existence, Black farmers raised cash crops like cotton, sugar, rice, and tobacco on land rented from former plantation owners. They also had to rent equipment and seed from white land owners who charged high prices to keep farms in a cycle of debt peonage. This exploitive system tethered Black families to an impoverished sharecropping landscape. Quote, we are walled in by cotton, unquote, is how novelist Richard Wright described the Black farmer's plight. Quote, trapped by the plantation system, we beg the breads of the lords of the land and they give it to us. They need us to work for them, end quote. This characterizes the exploitive bargain Black farmers had to strike with white landowners. Later, mid-century politically enfranchised and white-run citizen councils in, the, in Southern towns directly attacked civil rights organizers fighting to put an end to segregation through systemic intimidation. In the Jim Crow era, spanning from the post-reconstruction moment beginning in 1878, to the Civil Rights Acts of 1965 and 66, white Southerners actively disenfranchised constitutional rights to diminish Black political and economic power and to dehumanize and devalue Black life. One of the most lethal and effective forms of intimidation by mobs of white citizens, often surreptitiously sanctioned by elected officials, law courts, and police officers, was lynching, the violent murder of men, women, and children, like the 14-year-old Till. In these public spectacles of vigilante justice without trial, white Americans hung their black victims from trees in public squares, from bridges, and in forests at the outskirts of town. Lynchings took place from the end of the Civil War through to the early 1960s in towns and cities from Louisiana to Illinois, from Kansas to Maryland, though the majority took place in 12 Southern states. The unlawful event attracted hundreds of people, sometimes thousands, including families to witness the hanging, shooting, burning, 
and dismemberment of those accused of anything that white citizens imagined as upsetting rigid racial dictates, including the act of merely existing. Gleeful witnesses snatched body parts as grisly mementos, and crowds posed for photographs in front of disfigured corpses. Since the dehumanization of Black people into commodities has been foundational to the formation of modern racial capitalism, enterprising photographers sold and circulated these images as postcards that captured memorable events integral to the quaint Southern way of life. Angry mobs justified the lynching of thousands of black men and boys in Jim Crow era as the meeting out of swift justice and as a means of protecting the dignity, dignity and honor of white wives and daughters. In comparison, as black muckraking journalist Ida B. Wells documented in the late 19th century, the rape of black women and girls by white men, violent acts that were part of a long history of slave owners asserting mastery typically went unpunished because white Southerners controlled the government and the courts primarily through routine voter suppression in the form of polling tests, taxes, and threats of violence, Black residents were unable to bring vigilantes who carried out these crimes and murders to justice. These regimes of racial terror ensured that Black Americans would stay impoverished, without power, and on the other side of the tracks. On that fateful day of August 24th, 1955, Carolyn Bryant, a 21-year-old white woman, falsely claimed that the young Emmett Till had made a sexually explicit gesture while visiting Bryant's grocery store with friends to purchase candy. The Bryants made a living by selling provisions to black sharecropper families in the town of Money, Mississippi. As the couple told Look Magazine, they they sold, quote, snuff and fat back to Negro field hands on credit, end quote. Incensed by the child's alleged behavior, which had transgressed the codes of racial segregation that kept local black residents in fear and in poverty, but more importantly, separate and in their place, Bryant's husband and brother-in-law kidnapped Till, who was in the area visiting family while on holiday from his Chicago home. After the two men snatched Till from his uncle's home in the dead of night, they viciously beat and shot the teenager in a nearby barn. Using barbed wire, along with a 75 pound fan from a cotton gin, the two murderers weighed down and disposed of his body in the Tallahatchie River. The men hoped the silty flows of the river would carry away any trace of their calculated sadistic murder of the innocent young boy. Born in Webb, Mississippi in 1921, about 30 miles north of Money, Mamie Carthen left the impoverished Mississippi Delta for Illinois with her parents when she was two years old. The family who joined the Great Migration out of the dead-end sharecropping economy to seek better work and a better life in industries in the North. Mamie married twice, but chose to raise her son Emmett on her own in the south side of Chicago, a bustling black segregated enclave that sociologist Horace Caton and Sinclair Drake described as, quote, eight miles of land where a black metropolis was growing in the womb of the white, end quote. Though Mamie Till Mobley was born in the Southern Black Belt, she settled into its Northern doppelganger the Black Belt of Chicago, with its own histories of segregation, racial violence, and riots instigated by white mobs. In the summer of 1955, Mamie Till Mobley sent her young son Emmett on a train south to stay with her uncle Moses Wrights in Money, Mississippi. Tensions in the South and anger among whites had escalated after the recent Supreme Court ruling, Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, made racially segregated schools illegal. Believed to be under siege, white Southerners vowed to defend their territory, their political and economic dominance, and their Southern way of life, as they had in the Civil War, through collective acts of violence and terror against their Black neighbors. Till Mobley would never see her son again after she bid him farewell. Upon hearing the news of his murder, she refused to let her son be buried in Mississippi, 
and instead insisted his remains be sent back to Chicago. Upon viewing his mutilated decomposed body, which could only be identified by the silver ring he wore, she collapsed. Twice married to difficult and at times abusive men, Till Mobley was a working mother raising a young son on her own. As such, she did not easily fit into respectability's template for virtuous black womanhood. That fact did not curtail her quest for the world to mourn her loss. In a bold act of defiance, she refused to quietly grieve and insisted upon making visible the aftermath of the racist lynching of her son. She contacted the Chicago Daily Defender and the locally headquartered offices of Ebony and Jet Magazine, all three of which had national, wide national readerships. At her son's memorial services, Till Mobley arranged for the funeral home to have an open casket. Thousands of Chicagoans came to pay respects, but also witnessed white supremacy's unrelenting project to dehumanize and destroy black life. Johnson's gripping photographs of the funeral published in Jet showed Till's unrecognizable faith, face and Mamie Till Mobley wrapped by grief. The photographers, Till Mobley, and the images, viewers, entered into a civil contract. That, argues scholar Ariello Azule, overrode pity, empathy, shame, or compassion in order for Till Mobley to become a participant citizen with others in a rehabilitated public sphere. Mamie Till Mobley refused for her or her son to be made invisible in the racist public sphere of Jim Crow America. She also instinctively understood that justice for her son's lynching would not be swift, if it would ever arrive, and that her son's murderers might never be convicted. Indeed, one month later, in September 1955, an all-white, all-male jury in Sumner, Mississippi, took five days to acquit Till's murderers, Roy Bryant and J.W. Millam. An all-white grand jury in LaFleur County, where Till's body was dragged out, dragged from the Tallahatchie River, refused to indict the same two men for kidnapping. As these white juries entered and exited the courthouses, their defiance of the law was in part validated by the sentiments of the sacrifice, brave deeds, and eternal glory in defending the Southern way of life that was also symbolized by Confederate monuments standing outside both the Tallahatchie and Lafleur County courthouses. These monuments, both erected by the United Daughters of the Confederacy in 1913 with the full support of municipal governments, the women embellished these Beaux-Arts style white marble obelisks with weeping wives and mothers, honorable soldiers and brave officers to historicize and recuperate the nobility of white supremacy and antebellum Southern values. Despite their confession of kidnapping and murder in an article in the 1956, in the January 1956 issue of Look Magazine, for which they were paid the sum of $3,000, Bryant and Millam were never punished for taking the life of Emmett Till. These events proved that racial terror had not abated after the Civil War and emancipation ended slavery. They also pr proved that justice was unattainable for Black Americans. The failure to convict Till's murderers only galvanized activists of the burgeoning civil rights movement. Under Jim Crow segregation, Black Americans like Till Mobley and her family found themselves marginalized and excluded in the public spaces that shaped the political, economic, and social life of towns and cities, especially in the South. De facto and du jour segregation limited or prevented access to all forms of public spaces. Courthouses, schools, theaters, museums, swimming pools, restrooms, markets, hair salons, waiting rooms, hospitals, auditoriums, cinemas, cemeteries, and parks. 
Blacks sought temporary occupation of mainstream public spaces, such as world's fairs and expositions, or established their own counter public spaces in segregated Black communities. Civil rights boycotts, marches, and sit-ins to reclaim the right to be in public space was a proxy war for the right to be fully enfranchised Americans. With these limitations, the economic precarity wrought by racial capitalism and the constant threat of violence from aggrieved rights, whites with riots and spates of bombings in cities like Chicago in 1919, or towns like Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921, and Rosewood, Florida in 1923 had proved, Blacks rarely erected permanent memorials and monuments honoring Black history or historical figures. Thus, organizations like the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, founded by Carter G. Woodson in 1915, worked with newspapers like the Chicago Defender to institute Negro History Week that popular, popularized notable events and figures of Black history. In the first half of the 20th century, Black Americans purchased and framed images of Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, and W.E.B. Du Bois to display in their homes and businesses. To raise the historical consciousness of Black Americans was a project that the labor, civil rights, and Black nationalist movements of all stripes saw as integral to the fight against structural, economic, and political racism's devastating impact on Black life. Therefore, Mamie Till Mobley turning to the press, to the photographic image, to expose anti-Black racism's deadly enactment and memorialize the death of her son falls within a long history of how Black Americans utilize alternative forms to engage in memory work, or as scholar Christina Sharp suggests, wake work, when denied access to mainstream public spaces. Despite the profound sorrow wrought from losing her only child, Despite her disenfranchisement of rights and justice dictated by the same regime of white supremacy that murdered her son, despite a hostile American public sphere, Mamie Till Mobley took two radical actions. One, she refused the terms under a regime of white supremacy that would have rendered her grief and grievances invisible. Two, she mobilized the black counter public sphere to demand justice. The photographs of Till's wake and funeral circulated in the black press, then in the mainstream media to expose the brutality of racial prejudice unchecked by law. But more significantly, Till Mobley utilized the contractual nature of the photograph to actualize what Azalee identifies as anchoring spectatorship in civic duty, quote, toward the photographed persons who have not stopped being there, toward dispossessed citizens who in turn enable rethinking the concept and practice of citizenship." End quote. Under Jim Crow segregation, Till Mobley was excluded from public spaces and discourse by the violence that underwrites white America's hegemony. It is therefore vital to understand how she combined one of photography's earliest functions to commemorate the deceased with photography's civil contract to construct a lasting public memorial for her son, Emmett Till, one that demanded justice. Till Mobley's photographic memorial acknowledges the legacy of racial terror in ways that the commemorative markers in Crable Landing at the Sumner County Courthouse and the ruins of Bryant's Market, the latter two erected by the Mississippi Department of Archives and History cannot, especially in a public domain still ruled by that same anti-Black violence. In the midst of writing this talk in early November, 2019, a group of six men and two women all dressed in Black polos and khakis, the uniform of the League of the South a documented white supremacist group gathered around the new till marker at Grable Landing. Exactly. We gotta go, man. Let's go. We gotta go. Come on. Move it. 
The apparent leader stated for the two women filming the stunt, quote, we are all here at the Emmett Till monument that represents the civil rights movement for blacks, end quote. Standing between the Mississippi state flag that bears in its design a Confederate stars and bars and the flag of the League of the South, the unidentified man asked, quote, what we all want to know is where are all the white people, end quote. An ear piercing alarm filled the air and scattered the group who fled in their vehicle. Aware that the new marker would continue to attract vandals and hate groups, the Emmett Till Memorial Commission installed an alarm and cameras at the site. As documented by the Southern Poverty Law Center, members of the League of the South have been posing in front of civil rights sites in cities like Selma, Alabama and Little Rock, Arkansas, and posting them online as a recruitment tool. This is but one of the many racist groups and individuals like the Ole Miss frat boys who symbolically enact and perpetrate violence against monuments to black histories. One form of racial violence routinely unleashed against black peoples to affirm their white supremacy. 300 miles east of Grable Landing in Montgomery, Alabama, a new monument at the Equal Justice Initiatives, the EJI, Peace and, Memori Peace and Justice Memorial Center honors Emmett Till, along with 23 other victims killed by racial violence in the 1950s. To aid the public in comprehending the historic and geographic scope of racial terror, the new monument, along with the nearby National Monument to Peace and Justice, designed by Mass Design, recognizes the 4,424 documented victims of lynching during the Jim Crow era. In collaboration with groups around the country who seek to publicly recognize lives lost to and those impacted by organized racial violence, the EJI has also launched the Community Remembrance Project that places historical markers at lynching sites like this one in Selma around the nation. Like the Emmett Till marker at Grable Landing, EJI's markers remind local residents of acts of lynching whose perpetrators were rarely brought to trial, and if so, were never convicted for their actions like Till's murderer. This uh, sign of that community remembrance project of John Henry James sits just on the other side of Court Square from the Stonewall Jackson Monument that I began my talk with. A recent story in this Saturday's Guardian reported that after years of pressure from family and also from the public, along with a recent confession by Carolyn Bryan that she had lied about Till's actions, the FBI is about to wrap up a three-year investigation of the incident. The EJI, a private nonprofit organization, took up this civic task of making visible the history of lynching and its legacy in mass incarceration amid Montgomery, Alabama's heritage landscape, one that dutifully honors Confederate presidents in general, but has remained silent, for example, about those sites where its lucrative slave trade transpired. As a consequence for not being a municipal endeavor, the new AJI's memorials were built on a site south of the city's historic center. While it is not obvious or noted by most visitors as they enter the National Memorial to Peace and Justice, a security point and fence encloses the six acre site, a condition rarely found at memorials or monuments erected in public spaces or on public land. The enclosure of the fence singles, like the plexi enclosed bulletproof historical marker at Grable Landing, that violence in the name of white supremacy continues to shape 
America's commemorative landscape. I want to add a COVID-19 coda about Mississippi today. With many rural hospitals closed or on the edge of bankruptcy, 18% of poor households uninsured, which is near the bottom of rankings for uninsured American, overall healthcare ranked last in the nation with 20% of its population food insecure and 20% of its citizens impoverished, these are the legacies of anti-Black racism and racial capitalism in the state of Mississippi. In the first week of March 2020, mayors and cities like Tupelo called for shelter in place actions to stem the spread of COVID-19. The Republican Governor Matt Reeves overturned these actions, leading gun and ammo stores, restaurants, beaches, and churches to open again to the public and for profit. By early Mississippi, by early April, Mississippi led the nation in the number of hospitalizations with almost one third of those diagnosed with the disease in need of urgent care. The current deadly impact of COVID-19 continues the devastation of black life in the wake of slavery, the crippling segregation of Jim Crow and mass incarceration. These remain the inequalities of Americans' public sphere and the legacy within its public spaces. Thank you for watching.